strengths and wake, uh, weakness of, of agent-based modeling platforms or platforms that support it. And um, the primary ones I'm going to refer to here uh, are NetLogo, Repass, ModGen, AnyLogic, and InsightMaker. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. And in fact, it's a changing landscape. Um, I have updated these notes based on more recent uh, understanding and, uh, and factors involving change of platforms. Um, but I, I would, if I, if I had my druthers, I would have added Eventity here and probably Simulate, which has some additional, um, uh, additional hybrid capacities. So I want to briefly hit on these, recognizing that because we only have an hour for covering three topics, um, each of which is textured, I, I don't have time to go into this in full detail. I'm glad to expand on this tomorrow, okay? Um, if, there's, if there's interest or in other ways. So uh, the broad uh, five of them are, are listed here. Um, uh, so uh, one of them is, is Repast. Repast uh, uh, goes back um, to the earliest days of the 2000s. It's a platform I've used um, before I was using any logic. Uh, Repast was my mainstay. Uh, before Repast um, was other systems that you can't currently get. Um, uh, it's an open source system, um, meaning that uh, it's available freely. And in fact, the so-called source code, the, the, the way in which it's created, is available and in principle for modifications. It's a very rich tool. Um, and there's actually a very high performance variant that's available for those who are seeking very high performance models, like models with many millions of people in the population. Um, and it can scale up further than any logic. Any logic, we've done things about a million, a little bit more um, for some models. Uh, this can go up to many million with a high performance version. Okay? Um, uh, it has some visual support. And uh, you can actually use multiple languages. The primary one is Java, but you can use uh, something called Groovy as well. Um, and um, it does have limited support for hybrid modeling. They've tried to put in place some support for system dynamics. I understand from someone who's used it very heavily for a model that it's kind of creaky at that time, but maybe it's, it's come along further. It's a very nice R export interface. I think it's called R Commander, um, which is, is quite good. Um, disadvantages of this platform are uh, it's really a platform designed for people who are software engineers um, who know their way around uh, programming very well. It's highly, it's highly code based. Windchill has actually done quite a bit of work work in this. And while um, both of us will be, be very frank about uh, many of the limitations that beset any logic, um, uh, Repast is really, um, it's really got some big problems when it comes to use by people who are not software engineers and not prepared to do, to build up a software and engineering project. I will note, remember that Earlier, my, my comments, I noted this project that had become unsustainable where the, the people in charge of it didn't understand what was going on. That was written in Repast. Okay? And a lot of the challenge was it was opaque. They couldn't, they couldn't see what was going on. They had no way of, of knowing what that model logic was because it was all on this, this sort of um, complex of Java code. Um, and the output from this I find quite cumbersome. You have to, at least when I've been using it, you have to declare in the code, I want to create a graph of this, I want to do a table of this, and it's very, it's very clunky. Something in any logic that's declarative, you just declare I want to graph this, I want to show this, or what have you, is, is, is very clunky. And larger models really become quite opaque with this. So while it does scale, you have to scale your software engineering. It really requires someone who has a very good programming foundation to be working with that. And with that comes the risk of disconnect to the person who's designing the model, who's sort of shaping what the model assumptions should be from how it's implemented, which can cause big problems, like it did in that project I mentioned. NetLogo 
is a platform that's been around in its, including in its predecessor form, Star, uh, Star Logo, from about as long as I've been doing modeling. 1990 was the first time I encountered it. And then our paths diverged until some years later. I, I, have, a, I have a very high esteem for NetLogo. It's free and open source as well. Um, it's a shallower learning curve. It's made for beginners. It has a good accompanying book for it. And it has some support for system dynamics modeling, although my impression is, I'm looking for more information on this, but my impression is that it's kind of as an alternative to ABM rather than a chance to mix them thoroughly. I, I need to check this, and I'll comment more on it tomorrow. Um, but that's when it was when I checked it out closely earlier. And, um, and it, it allows support for both platforms, but not in a way that really allows the rich intermixing we see in any logic. Um, the disadvantages here, which I, I've heard from many people who, you know, this is their main tool, is the language is very awkward. It's kind of its own obscure little language. So you can't, you can't find people, typically, who know the language except if they're longtime modelers. Um, so you're not going to be able to find someone to help you. Like finding someone to help you with a bit of, of Java code and any logic or even a repass, that's, there's all sorts of people around who can give you a bit of a pointer as to what, what's going on here. Why, am I, why is he giving this message? Whereas the language here is very specific to NetLogo, and it's, I, I'm a language person. I design languages. It's, it, it's really a poorly designed language. I, I'm sorry, but it's, it's really, it should be done so much better. We could do it so much better. And this tool with a better language would be my tool of choice. It will be, it'll be very, very, very good. And um, its language is, its real, is a key impediment. And I find quite a few people who start off in it you know, struggling with the language, needlessly. And Java, there's tons of information online about how to use Java. NetLogo, it's, it's again, the reference information for NetLogo is, is, is limited. But there is this book. And, and there's some other materials online that are, that are a little bit. But it's for NetLogo, right? Um, it's not a general thing where you find hundreds of thousands of tutorials on it or something like that. Um, there are some built-in constraints um, with NetLogo that limit the flexibility of it um, a fair bit. We've run it in our group. And, and yeah, it's, it, for, for simple models and small, small models, toy models and sort of stylized models, it's, it's really nice. It's really nice. Um, what I've heard from people who, again, use it day in, day out is scaling up the population size to over dozens of thousands, like over 50,000 or 75,000. It, it's dead in the water. Any logics, if you design your model in the right way and so on, you can get up to many, many hundreds of thousands. This, this sort of reaches limits much smaller. Now, maybe that's not a concern for you, in which case this could be a really good option um, uh, for getting started, but you're still going to need to deal with the language issue. Um, you really need to talk with someone who is, is a NetLogo user. Um, uh, and larger models can become quite opaque because of the language. Um, uh, some of my students have experience in NetLogo. Winchell has used it. Um, I know Narges has looked at it some um, and, and looked, uh, looked at it several years back with us. Um, uh, if you're interested in NetLogo and you, you want to go through it a little bit with a student, I'd be glad to, you know, tomorrow if you're around, to, to have them work with you on a NetLogo little net logo model, they might be able to help you over some of the hurdles, recognizing they're going to be doing a lot of refreshing and learning. But, uh, but it might help you get over the bit, you know, the basics of it and get to the point where you can, you can work with a little model. But it, it's, it's pretty opaque. Um, one of the shortcomings here is the design of the model, the kind of logic of the model, is all once again in code. It's like repass. It's in code. It's, it's, it's this code you look at. And as software engineers, even um, working professionally in software, that's hard. For modelers, it's, it's terrible. It distracts you from seeing what your, what your characterization is of the world. 
by being so distracted by all the little minutiae of how it's implemented. You're not seeing what the design of the model is, um, which is one of the foremost attractions to me. Probably the, the biggest attraction to me in any logic is you focus a lot of your attention more on the what, like state charts, and, and you have events, and you have you know, graphs, and you have uh, statistics, et cetera. Um, OK, um, I'm a big fan of NetLogo, though. I think it's a great thing to have, and I'm happy to empower people who are using it. And I think it has a, a rich potential. I just wish they'd fix certain things about it. Um, if they won't, we will. We're, we're, we're working towards a better solution. Um, OK, ModGen. ModGen is a system used for microsimulation modeling. It came out of the, the chief creator of Statistics Canada's um, uh, simulation infrastructure, um, uh, Michael Wolfson, who I have enormous respect for and admiration of. Um, it has since evolved to OpenM project, which is an open source uh, free version of this. Um, it has some very nice features to it. It's free. It allows declarative output specification, which means basically you can say, output things in this sophisticated table format. And it will say, yes, ma'am. And it will do it. Okay? Um, it has a thing called the bio browser for inspecting longitudinal data. Now, any logic has gotten some abilities to inspect longitudinal data. Now you can actually, in any logic, say, record for, the, uh, for all agents, for example, their history of entering and exiting these states or going on these transitions. But um, the bio browser in ModGen is a particularly nice way of interacting with that information. And it's highly scalable. This is used for you know, tens of millions of agents. It, it came out of Statistics Canada, and it's designed to scale to I think UN has used it indirectly for 80 million agents. Or, um, it is predominantly, and this gets to, to micro simulation, it's predominantly aimed, just like traditional micro simulation, it's predominantly aimed at micro simulation view of agents, which means agents are individuated, they're individuals, but they evolve more or less independently of other agents and often totally independently, which it flies in the face of the real focus of most agent-based modeling on agent-agent interactions, where agent-agent interactions, whether it's you know, a drug user and a dealer and or their clinician, addictions medicine specialist, and my primary care physician who gives them their, their you know, OxyContin um, and with their family, that's like the central point of interest I don't know that I'd use ModGen as my tool for that. It's, it's really good for this micro simulation view. And traditionally, what happens is you run through each person in the population, their entire lifespan at once, and then you go on to the next person, the next person, the next person, their entire lifespan you simulate. And that doesn't lend itself, that traditional view doesn't lend itself to them interacting because <laughs> you're simulating A's entire lifespan and as if B, you don't know anything about B. So how can they be affected by B? It does allow for interaction, but it's, it, it, it's, not, it's not a great fit for it. Um, our group has used ModGen. Um, our U group has used all of these, for that matter. But our group has used ModGen. UN has done a significant amount of programming in ModGen. She's also done a significant amount of using of models created using ModGen. And if there's interest, I could connect you to UN. And again, we'd be glad to, to talk about its open end update. It does require some programming sophistication. Um, Repast is the language Java. Java, um, Repast at the top, requires some serious Java work. ModGen is in the language C++. C++. Um, takes the challenges and confusions of Java and adds considerably to them. You start to have to worry about deallocation and allocation, and you start dealing with, <laughs> I won't get into it. Look, I've written hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines of C++ code. And uh, I would suggest it's probably not best to go there. Okay, It's probably not best to go there. But 
if you want to, we're glad to send a chaperone, OK, and, and help you with this. And you could look at our mod gen code. We have the same model in something like five different frameworks. And so if you're ever interested, we could show you that little model. Um, it has poor support for parallelization in the early form. Uh, they aspired to get high performance by using this lower level language, C++. But it's not really good for, for parallelization. By contrast, repast high performance is, is better for that. And I find it, it's not very well designed as a language. It's, it's just, it's not very clear. Again, you get so caught up in the how, you, you miss the forest for the trees. You see, you're in the weeds, and you see all these little weeds around. You're, you're trying to see the forest as a model. You're trying to see what you're characterizing about the world, because your interest is in what's going on in the world and how your model characterizes it. Instead, you're stuck you know, dealing with, with minutiae of, is it in the zeroth element of the array or the first element of the array? It's, oh, man, it's for the birds. Um, sometimes seeing things at such a micro level. You really want a language that allows some high-level view. And ModGen has a lot to recommend it, but its, it's specification of the model is it's just not there. It's just not there. It's, it's an earlier generation that's got some major problems. Now, InsightMaker, I'll come to any logic at the end. Um, InsightMaker here, I don't, I don't know why this is, is cut off here, um, but uh, doesn't seem too egregiously cut off. But I'll see if I can. Oh, man. Um, OK. Um, highly visual interface supports. Yeah. So InsightMaker is a tool that Jeff McDonald has used a lot. I don't Have any of you seen Jeff's InsightMaker diagrams? They're awesome. Have you seen them? Yeah. So if you haven't seen this, if you haven't seen InsightMaker, go see it. OK? Um, go to InsightMaker.com. It's an internet-based tool. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and go explore it. There's a set of insightmaker.com. And there's a set of models here. Uh, if you go to explore insights here, and you go look for health or healthcare, I'll try healthcare, OK? Um, and you will find a large number of models. Now, for those interested in the qualitative side as well as the quantitative side of modeling, these things are just like rich, rich repositories of, uh, of ideas and so on. Um, and Jeff is an absolute master at creating these visual diagrams that are, in many cases, runnable. Um, uh, OK, yeah, sure. Um, uh, and that have stories associated with them. Um, and Jeff has put together these diagrams that that talk about um, that talk about uh, systems in a rich visual way with pictures. And he you have these unfolding stories where you step forward um, and it's it sort of tells a a narrative story associated with it. So I'll say exit story here, and then I'll say view the story. And you notice as I say step forward, there's some description on the bottom here. Okay, um, and it sort of describes the ideas behind what's uh, what's shown. And Jeff has actually created these um, for a wide variety of um, of, ins of insights. These are called insights in Insight Maker. And um, I am honored to tell you that a fair number of these Jeff created, inspired by slides of my boot camp or, or sort of some of the lectures here uh, over the years. And um, others of them have been inspired by theses and, and findings. And you can see it weaves together these very visual depictions with um, structured descriptions. And a fair number of these are runnable in the sense that you can run a simulation and see the results over time with some of relationships captured. Um, and it turns out InsightMaker um, supports a limited type of agent-based modeling. Um, so they support 
they support, in addition to this graphical unfolding of stories, they support system dynamics modeling and separately agent-based modeling. Not really hybrid modeling, but, but agent-based modeling in a very, in a sort of constrained way. Um, it's an online system. It's super easy to share with others. I can share with you. You can make a copy of my insight and then modify it and share it back with others. It all runs in a browser, and it's, it's highly visual. Um, uh, and it does support ABM and SD. It, it's not clear that it's scalable. There's fewer supporting tools. I'm, I'm a little bit worried about its sustainability. Uh, the creator of it is a software developer at Google and during their full-time uh, job. And so this is kind of not their day job. And I'm a little bit worried of one-man sort of shows, you know. Um, but it's got a lot going for it in terms of of insights and Jeff's Jeff's insights online are just brilliant and lots of them are, are very very thought provoking some of them brilliant so I would suggest if you're not aware of it become aware of it explore it you're, you'll find a lot if you're trying to learn system science and its applicability um, either in health or healthcare um, uh, in combinations of them of course um, uh, this is a rich repository of models there as rich of what I've provided to you in a more uh, quantitative, simulatable fashion. But a lot of the models you'll find are not simulatable. Some of them are, OK? Um, lots to think about there. Um, and if you're interested in being connected with Jeff and talking with him, he spent untold amounts of time on this. And he's also, um, uh, he's also met uh, richly with the creator of it and talked about its future and, and how it might evolve, et cetera. Um, Final tool is this tool called AnyLogic. Um, and AnyLogic um, is a tool I've been using since about 2005. It's been my main tool for agent-based modeling since that time, and um, my main tool uh, for, certainly for hybrid modeling. Why? Well, there are two fundamental reasons. One is mostly declarative model specification. I can mostly describe, I don't know if my students realize this is the huge motivation, but this is probably the number one motivation. I am a software engineer who has worked in a wide variety of professional software development capacities. Um, and uh, I teach software engineering. I, I, I speak and, and have written you know, uh, what may be across my career a million lines of code. Now, um, it's many, many hundreds of thousands. Um, when, and when I'm a software engineer, I, I uh, very much enjoy it. I also am a modeler. And I characterize things in the world from a dynamic modeling perspective. When I am thinking about the world in a modeling capacity, I don't like to have to think as a software engineer. It's not that I don't know how to. Of course I know how to. But I want to keep my focus on what is going on in the world. I want to keep my focus on characterizing the world, as we say, declaratively. This is what I believe is a good characterization of it. And when I have to, when I have to think in terms of variables and references and pointers and, and you know, declaring, uh, declaring this to be static and so on, it distracts me from my fundamental need to sort of think about processes in the world. In short, it obscures the forest for the trees, and often worse than that, for like the little pebbles on the ground and so on. And, and it's this fundamental desire to focus on the what that predominantly drives me into any logic's you know, um, mixed embrace. Um, and uh, I really, really value you know, the capacity to declare state charts, action charts, uh, events in my model, to be able to define within my model statistics uh, in a declarative fashion to be calculated on the underlying population, to be able to say, create this graph of this data, and this data is, is uh, recorded from this thing over time, or what have you. What's this? Ability to say, this is what I want, go do it. That is a big attraction. It's an attraction for me personally because it keeps my attention on the what. But it's an attraction for those who I work with who are not 
software engineers and never want to be, thank you very much, um, that, that it allows them to understand what I mean without, you know, I want the people in my team, my modeling team, because I will not get a, you know, get a influence a project that puts in place fixes that stay fixed using useful models that get used unless I have a team around me from very different backgrounds. And I want them to understand what I'm describing. And I want them to understand that so that they tell me when I'm off base. You know, they say, you may think that, but that's not the case, or you're missing this. That, that whole idea of models as learning tools and welcoming critique by taking it out of our head and putting it in front of people in a way that they can critique and collectively refine. And that's something I can do with a what. If I give you pages of code, you're unlikely to be able to critique it effectively. You'll, you'll have to shrug your shoulders and say, I trust you. And that short changes the learning going on with modeling. So any logic's commitment to mostly declarative model specification is absolutely key. It also factors a role in building things in our boot camp. Any logic is far short of where it could be here. Grievously short. And they need to up their game in a big way. Um, they, um, they, they need to more fully embrace the declarative paradigm. There's lots of ways we could make this more extensive and allow us to more thoroughly, um, uh, thoroughly visualize the what. And to their credit, They've listened to Jeff and my feedback on this on, on a number of points. And I hope that they will move even further in this direction. But they need to do so, because um, it is still far short of, what, of its potential. And it inhibits effective use uh, in teams in those shortcomings. But uh, compared to the other platforms, it is by far the best for this in terms of understanding the what. Um, now, beyond that, another key desire reflected in this boot camp is this capacity to flexibly mix and introduce multiple types of dynamic modeling. I can weave together discrete event simulation with agents. I can weave together some system dynamics with agents in a, in a rich way declaratively with some implications. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. Um, but in a way that is, is liberating in terms of our ability to shape model description, what is described based on our understanding of what's needed. Um, it has reusable model pieces that we can sort of reuse from one model to another in terms of these, uh, these classes and so on. Um, there's a large, I, you know, I built up a large set of, of health models. There's some strong supporting tools like sensitivity analysis, calibration, which you saw earlier today, and, and a pretty good set of tools that they provide. There's also tools like Winchell has created and others that we have created in our lab to go around with this that I'd welcome anyone to, to pick up and use, like that one that automatically documents it when you run, run your models. Winchell is an amazing tool that he uses when he runs it to automatically export into R, um, and, and it's great. Um, it has GIS integration better than any of the other packages I know of. What are the prime downsides? Don't, like, don't get me started. Um, there's, there's a lot of areas where any logic falls short, in my view. Um, I think, in my view, the, the people who use any logic, a lot of them come out of universities where they're trained in any logic. Um, and they need to make a better relationship with, with university researchers in terms of helping to lower the price. I, 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 uh, I think the price is, is frankly too high. And um, I think it limits a lot of university researchers who would use it from using that platform, which limits the number of students who get exposed to it, among other things. And I think they're shortchanging themselves there. So the dollar, I'm keenly aware of this dollar um, cost. And um, it's been a point of ongoing feedback for me to the, to the AnyLogic uh, developers. Um, uh, the fact is, if you want to move beyond simple models, you need some Java code. And many videos of me online and some past iterations of this boot camp have, have featured AnyLogic tutorials 
um, that, that involve detailed discussion of what you need to know Java-wise for any logic. I've taught that many t past times. I didn't teach it here because I've taught it so many times. You could find videos of me teaching it easily, and I didn't think it was the best match for this audience, given the needs. But um, I'm sure I will teach that again. It's compared to repast, it's orders of magnitude, like 100 times less Java code. But you need, well, OK, maybe 10 times less. But you need, you need Java code. You need Java code for your models, OK, um, at some point. And that, I know the pain that that involves. And Java is not the right language for it. Java is not the right language to do for any logic to use. They should use a different language. And I've given them suggestions. And so far, they haven't bitten. Um, we know how to do so much better than Java. We know how to do so much better than NetLogo. We know how to do so much better than the APIs and, and Repast. Um, it's embarrassing. I mean, C++, give me a break. Um, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. We shortchange, you know, teaching any of these other platforms, I'd be, it's like be advocating self-harm or something. You know, um, use of Repast I consider harmful to health, at least mental health, for most, you know, health scientists. It's, no, it's horrible. It's horrible. I mean, ask, ask Winchell. Um, <laughs> he's laughing because he knows it's true. Um, after he, you know, helped probably do half the work for a PhD dissertation that depended on repast for a social scientist. Um, uh, so um, take it from an old man. You don't want to go there. Um, system dynamics abridge hybrid modeling is frankly performance impaired. It's, it's seriously problematic. They got to fix that. And they, they can fix it. Um, and they should as soon as possible. Um, because it, it really is a problem. There's an easy work, there's a, a OK workaround, but they got to fix it because it would be so much nicer for doing hybrid modeling if they just fix their implementation of it. Um, or let Winchell fix it for them. Um, uh, model specification is a little bit diffuse. When you have repast, all the code is right there. When you have any logic, there's bits of code scattered around your model. And you can generate documentation, as I showed this morning, generate the documentation on your model. But, um, uh, but uh, when you look at the model, it's not obvious where the there there is. Where, where is the there um, in the model? It's like, there's bits of code around, and you kind of got to know how to describe things with any logic to know where to look. So I'm aware of that as a, as a shortcoming in the interface, and they are as well. Um, any, uh, any logic scalability-wise, um, you're talking hundreds of thousands of agents if you're not doing anything too fancy with hybrid modeling involving SD, et cetera. But it's not easy if you're not doing fancy visualizations and so on. It doesn't come easy always. And it's good to talk to people who have been through that a lot. But generally, I'm not happy unless we can scale into the hundreds of thousands. Um, there are some issues with network building, with built-in networks that Wade or, or Winchell could tell you about, that uh, the built-in network algorithms for like scale-free networks, they tend to really slow down. UN has found this as well in the hundreds of thousands range. It, it, doesn't, it calculates the network for a long period of time. And we've created code to create it ourselves much faster. So I don't know what's going on there. But, um, but Winchell and, and Wade could tell you more about, about that. So this is a bit of a, of a rogues gallery for these tools. Um, for beginners. If you're a beginner and you're just setting out in system science in this world and you want to get your feet wet with ABM, I would recommend either NetLogo or AnyLogic to get your feet wet. Insight Maker, if you're interested in the qualitative forms and telling stories with models and you're not heavily um, quantitative uh, focus, Insight Maker is worth it also. But I think NetLogo, lots of things to recommend it. The primary shortcoming I see is the language and the fact the language focuses on how to do things and not the what. You can't describe a state chart. You have to say, like, 
implement a state chart in code. And to me, that is just, it's wrong. It's, 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 it's doing injury um, because we understand it in terms of state charts, and we should be able to mirror our understanding of how we describe the model. And, um, but for simple models, NetLogo has a lot to go for it. A lot to go for it. And I'd recommend it to, visit, to, to starters, to people starting out in system science and agent-based modeling, uh, uh, particularly because of the large, uh, there's quite a few uh, example models in this good book and some other references online. Good stuff. Any logic I also think is accessible um, with a bit of pointers with uh, the Java components once you start creating bigger, um, you know, more serious models. Um, and you know, the students here, I'm sure, would be open. And this community I'm about to show you will be a great place to ask questions also. So this is kind of my view of the state of the field. It ain't pretty. Um, I have some more slides, and I have some particular slides on, on any logic strengths and weaknesses that you might want to take a look at. But I hope those are useful comments. And um, if you are interested in any of these packages and you want to get a taste, just talk with one of my students. Um, and they can, even if it's not tomorrow, uh, or for that matter, tonight, they can sit down with you r remotely and they could help you go through and just give you a flavor of what you'd be dealing with. You know, like show you some example models and talk with you about them. And, and you might be able to get a feel, is this a good fit for you? you know, if you want to try Insight Maker, they could show you some Insight Maker models or NetLogo, et cetera. Any questions about that? Questions about these platforms? Okay, I'm gonna, oh, oh, oh man. Okay, um, was it recording there?